In the previous tutorial video, we declared two attributes in the birthday book class. Specifically for the birthdays uh, attributes, we talk about uh, declaring the deferred class uh, list as the static type for birthdays. So that means we are applying the principle of program from the interface, but not from the implementation. And also it has to do with how many dynamic types you can actually use for this particular birthdays. So please make sure you review that topic from the previous video before you continue with the current one. And also we talk about uh, voice safety related issues about the attributes must be initialized always if they are uh, by default attached. So for the current video, we'd like to add a new attribute first of all, and then we'll try to develop the class invariants, which is something you should always uh, think about before you try to program uh, other routines for their pre and post conditions. So class invariants first. So now let's uh, add a new attributes here. So I'll simply type in the same section. So I would say count is of type integer. So this will be the size of the birthday book. So you can always uh, documents uh, using comments. So I can say uh, number of store name birthday records in the current book. Okay, just make sure everything compiles. Okay, so now what invariants can we write? Again, uh, review yourself. What what's really what does really a class invariant mean? Let's say if we want to declare a class invariance for the birthday book class, that means how can we characterize an a valid instance of the birthday book class? So what does it really mean for a birthday book class to a uh, birthday book instance to be valid? So now let's uh, visualize uh, what a uh, birthday book uh, object looks like, and then we can think about invariance from there. So let me switch to my iPad over here. So now imagine that you have already declared, let's say BB over here. So BB is a variable name, which is going to store the address of some birthday book uh, objects. Okay, let's say we have that declaration. So you can see BB over here. So at the runtime, it is going to point to some birthday book objects over here. And we know that for every birthday book, they're going to have at least three attributes over here that we have declared already. So you can see over here, we have uh, the names array. Let's say in this case, it's simply of size three over here. And also we have the birthdays uh, link list. And at this point, you actually simply just got uh, three nodes over here. Okay, so the first invariance would be really about the consistency of the counter. So the counters I'm talking about is, for example, you can see over here for bb.counts. Okay, so that would be the count for the birthday book. It's an overall size. So in this case, count should be three because we got three. We got, uh, we actually got here, we got Alan's birthday, Mark's birthday, and also Tom's birthday, right? They are in the corresponding uh, position in the uh, birthday book. Uh, the birthdays array, uh, sorry, the birthday link list. And so bb.count will just be three in this case. And what would be other uh, size that should be consistent as well? Well, apparently this array over here, the size should be, let's say bb.names.count. That should also be three. Apparently it is consistent uh, in the diagram. And the final one will be, what about the size for this particular link list for the birthdays? So in this case, we'll say bb dot birthdays dot count. That should also be three. So apparently you can see the diagram I'm drawing here. It is a consistent uh, birthday book instance. So that would be the simplest invariant we can write. So you should always think about the simple one first to characterize a valid instance of the class you, you're under your consideration. And then you can think about a more complicated one. So we'll do the first simple one first, and then we'll think about something that's slightly more complicated. Let me go back to uh, the class over here. And if you want to declare a class invariant, it should be at a class level. So go to the end of the class right before the end. So you would say invariants over here. So that would be the class invariant, right? Well, we already talked about it's a Boolean constraint, as many tagged class invariant you like. All of them together should really characterize what a valid birthday book object is. So now we can say uh, count. Uh, we can uh, let's, let's give a tag consistent counts. So the various count we're considering will be uh, the count of the current class, which I can just mention count. If you like, you can also say this dot count. Well, in iPhone, it should be current. 
the account. However, the current here is simply just implicit, like in Java, so you don't need to mention that if you don't like. Okay, current will be consistent with uh, names will be the attributes dot count as we said before the uh, number of names and also uh, you can say current dot count so let me for this one here I'll just uh, omit the current here just to show you both work and the count would also be equal to birthday dot count okay so, so this together will actually mean so these three values over here this value here the size of this array and the size of this list, this uh, link list. So they are all equal. So that's the first invariant we'd like to ensure. Okay, let me go back there and then I'll simply just compile. Okay, so everything works. I'm gonna write a, a test case very soon because apparently as soon as we have done uh, both invariants and also some command, we can start writing test cases. Okay, so let's now consider the second invariant that's more complicated. So mathematically, you can think about a birthday book being like a function, like a mathematical function. For example, if you look at this, let's say this is your birthday book. Uh, let me just show you a cleaner diagram over here. Okay. So now, how can we think about the birthday book being a function? So back in, in your 1090, if you define a mathematical function, so if you say BB is actually a function, so you can say BB, if I try to query about Alan, so Alan is like a domain. And then that should return back to you uh, it, his uh, corresponding birthday, which is September 14th, right? For example. On the other hand, if you say BB over here to be, uh, let's say, Alan, uh, Alan, Mark, and Tom. So these are the uh, domain. And what about someone who doesn't exist? What about Jim? So now this will be undefined over here. Okay, so that's uh, why you can think of it. But now, and a very important property for the domain is it should be a set, which means there should be no duplicates for the names. Or if you, you can think about uh, a birthday book also being a, a map that we learned about in the data, data structure course. So what uh, if you think about a map as a table where you got keys and also you got values. So what's really important about the keys uh, uh, serving for its search purpose would be uh, there should be no duplicates for the keys. So uh, the, the set of keys should be unique. So now this is something we would like to argue. We want to say for the set of, uh, for the list of uh, array of names over here, there should be no duplicates. But now how can we specify that? Okay. I would like to maybe show you how you can do that using predicate logic that you learned from 1090 using universal quantification. I'm pretty sure you learned something about it uh, previously. I will show it to you and then we'll see how we can translate it into IFO and then you will see that it's actually quite straightforward translation which you cannot really do in Java. Okay, let's uh, take a look. So how can I say that this particular array actually contain uh, no duplicates over here? Okay, so what I can do is let's consider maybe a ge more general case. Uh, let's say here, if I have an array over here, okay, so let's say start with index one, and then let's say this is A. The last index will be A dot count. You have as many elements as you like, okay? So now the idea would be, we want to really choose any arbitrary uh, two positions. If I choose position I, and also if I choose position J, okay? So I choose these two positions over here arbitrarily. So I'm gonna compare all the pair of combinations between I and J given that i and j are different it doesn't make sense for i and j to be the same slot of course they are the same elements right so now assuming that i and j are two distinct locations of the array so th what does that mean for the array to be unique that means for every such pair their containing elements should be not equal to mathematically speaking right so now how, how, we, how do we write it so we have to use two dummy variables in order to write this so let me write it down so we have to say over here, we say for every i and j such that, so uh, I'm going to specify a range, one less than or equal to i, also j, and less than or equal to a that counts. So first of all, i and j, they are actually uh, valid indices of the array. It is the case, okay? And now, what, what should be the predicate we should write? We should say what I said before, if i and j, first of all, they should be the uh, distinct locations. If they are not the distinct locations, we don't care, right? 
So now, so if we say every time we have a case like a don't care, that suggests you may want to use a logical implication as opposed to conjunction, because for conjunction, both conjuncts, you have to care. So I is not equal to J. In that case, we do care. So we say that implies A, I is not the same. So now if we want to compare object, for example, right, we say not equal to. So tell that is for, for us to compare uh, the contents. It's not equal to a j. Okay, so this is a very simple predicate to actually specify to say, uh, for this particular given array, no two slots that's the, uh, that are distinct actually got uh, actually store the same values uh, in the array. Okay, that's something I will, we would like to uh, specify. So how do we translate this into uh, iPhone? You can actually use across keyword. We can should we use across all or should we use across some? Or should we use a cross loop? Hopefully you wouldn't think you want to use a cross loop, right? Because a cross loop is just for writing instructions. But now in this case, we do want a Boolean expression over here. And since we said universal, so we should use across all. So how do we do it? The only catch is for a single across construct, we cannot introduce more than one dummy variable. That's the trick. Okay, so let me go back there and then let's uh, translate this. You will see the translation is actually quite straightforward. Okay. So now let's say new du no dupli no duplicates names over here. Okay, there, there should be no duplicates in the uh, names array. So now I want to introduce the first dummy variable. So I would say across. Okay. So now remember we should really change from s to is right away, so we don't have to use the cursor. And in this case, we don't want to write any instruction. A very common mistake is you actually use a loop over here in the context of a contract, like a class invariance, precondition, or postcondition. That's absolutely wrong. You can only use Boolean expression inside the contracts. Okay. So now we want to use universal. So let's use all over here. And now what do we want to cross over? Apparently, we want to cross over the uh, range of the uh, indices for array, right? In this case, names array. So what we'll do is we'll say from assuming that indices uh, start from one, that's a valid assumption. One uh, from one to uh, names dot count is so now for I and J, as I said before, it might be uh, better if you can think about having some prefix over here for the name, just avoid clashes with other variables. So I can say LI, okay? but you can name anything you like. I'm just saying just making one suggestion. However, you might be tempted to actually say li. So let's, let's first of all make sure everything compiles, right? But for now, I can just make a true over here. We'll, we'll, fig, uh, we'll figure out this in just a moment, okay? Just make sure everything compiles. So you might be tempted to actually simply write lj as well. It would be nice, wouldn't it, to actually be allowed to do this. However, if you try to compile, it's not going to allow you to do so. It's simply an, a syntax error, okay? So you have to work around with the syntax over here, okay? Each across can only allow you to introduce a new uh, dummy variable, only one. So I would suggest the following. So we're gonna introduce two. So let me change the uh, indentation a little bit just to make the uh, things a little bit more readable. Across all, right? And then you can think about across all, whatever, I'm going to specify over here that's going to replace true is just another Boolean expression. So now what can be a Boolean expression? Maybe just another across all. So what I will do is as its body over here, so I'll say across over here one, also the same index range dot count. And I'm going to change from S to is. And now it's going to be L J all. Okay, so hopefully you can see that. Okay, don't get the uh, big uh, the big picture lost. You can think about this guy over here. I'm highlighting over here. Oh, sorry. This line and also this line over here. That's the outer across. And then this inner across is like the body of the predicates for that the outer across. Okay. And now what can we do? Well, we do exactly what we said over there. We want to specify i not equal to j implies a i not equal to a j. Right? We have exactly the, uh, the, the suitable operators for us. So we can say over here, li not equal to, so for integer, like a primitive type, you can just say not equal to, you can use equal sign. But for comparing object contents, you can use tell them. lj implies over here, and then names at position li 
not equal to by comparison, right? So it's guaranteed. So since we're using tilde, so it's going to call the is equal uh, query from the uh, uh, string class that names over here L J. Okay, just make sure everything compiles. It does. Okay. So that's the uh, second variance. So I would say t uh, for this course, typically you don't really have to go beyond like a two nested level for the uh, across. But I'm just showing you, is, you can see the idea is pretty simple. Depending on your need, you may have to uh, introduce beyond two dummy variables, in which case you will know how to do it. Okay. Okay, let me recap what we have done for this video here. So we introduce uh, two invariants class invariant, which is actually more uh, more interesting than the invariants we did for the birthday uh, class. So number one, we talk about the consistent counts between the uh, birthday book objects, the count, and also its two implementation uh, attributes over here, the size of the array and size of the linked list. So these three counts should be consistent. Number two, for the class invariants, we talk about for names over here for the search purpose, it should be that it should be treated as a key. So there should be no duplicates for the key. So we first of all, we start with the mathematical formulation. And then given that Eiffel supports the, the such design idea, so we can use the across all for the universal quantification. The only catch is we have to use nested across in order to introduce uh, more than one dummy variable. That's what you have to watch out for. Okay, so make sure you understand this both at the logical level and also at the uh, programming level over here before you move on to the, ne uh, to the next video.